This episode is the final part in a series analyzing the war between the First Order and the New Republic. What you're about to watch is not an overview of that conflict as it was, but rather our idea of what it could have been if, for whatever reason, the Templin Institute were put in charge of directing its course. If you'd like to understand why we made the changes we did, be sure to watch the previous part in which we discussed the ways we felt the First Order New Republic War didn't quite work. And because this episode is, at its core, a reimagining of the conflict, we've made the decision to exclusively use concept art to portray it. Some of the artwork might contain elements you recognize, others might be repurposed, while others still might never have been brought to life. We also reached out to a variety of talented artists, who graciously allowed us to use their work. In this latter instance, you'll find their links in the description. So while this artwork doesn't always perfectly reflect our version of the war, it does serve as a fantastic starting point. And finally, the Templin Institute did commission one piece of artwork for use in this episode. For more details on how you can obtain a digital wallpaper version of it, stick around after the video. Thirty years to the hour after the Battle of Endor ended in the destruction of the second Death Star and the death of Emperor Palpatine aboard it, New Republic holonet operators noticed that every station in the Horsnian system had unexpectedly gone offline. Attempts to reconnect to the New Republic capital all failed, and the emergency activation of separate government and military communication lines produced similar results. Within minutes, orbital traffic control authorities began to report that every ship in the Horsnian system, carrying an automatic identification system, had disappeared, while the largest business consortium similarly complained of a sudden information gap in the Horsnian sector of the Corellian trade spine. By the time the New Republic emergency craft had verified the eyewitness reports of a tremendous explosion in the system, the architects of the Horsnian cataclysm had revealed themselves to the galaxy. In orbit of dozens and then hundreds of worlds, warships bearing the distinctive emblem of the ancient Sith Empire emerged from the darkness. The Second Galactic War had begun. This initial decapitating strike on the New Republic had been the result of the all-encompassing efforts of the Sith Eternal. Since the first remnants of the Galactic Empire had arrived in the Unknown Regions, the plans for the eventual counterattack upon their hated enemy had been continually discussed, drafted, and refined. Over the decades, it had attained an almost mythical status, known within the Sith Eternal simply as the Day. At its center was a military operation of staggering scope and potential, the Sloan Veers Plan, named for its two chief contributors. It had envisioned a rapid campaign towards Coruscant, a single war-winning offensive of the greatest possible impact that would culminate in a vast simultaneous advance across the whole of the Corellian run hyperroute. Within just 90 days, the conditions for multiple decisive battles against the New Republic could be achieved, inflicting such devastating losses that their ability to prosecute the war would be ended. Even after the assassination of its namesakes by Supreme Leader Snoke, the Sloan Veer's plan was relentlessly updated by their successors. As the capabilities of the Sith Eternal grew, it moved out of the realm of the hypothetical and into the actual. And as agents of the First Order gained influence within the New Republic, invaluable intelligence on its strengths, weaknesses, and dispositions was readily fed back to Exegol. On the eve of the war, the operation had grown to a masterwork of strategic planning, one that accounted for every systemic, organizational, bureaucratic, and psychological variable. The use of Starkiller Base, a weapon able to replicate the destructive power of the Death Star, albeit only once, was a late addition to the Sloan Veer's plan, but the final element, it was decided, necessary for its implementation. With a sense of historical justice, the operation would commence on the day in which much of the New Republic would be celebrating the victory of the Battle of Endor, when a large contingent of the Republic's Starfleet would be in orbit of its capital world. In the hours leading up to the activation of Starkiller Base, the Sith Legions and fleets were gripped by the fiercest sense of anticipation, so fanatical in their assurance of victory that it nearly had the effect of impacting their military discipline. Their highest commanders, though, 
the generals and admirals that would lead them had already grown concerned with developments occurring within the New Republic. Unbeknownst to the Sith Eternal, the secret of their presence within the Unknown Regions was not as complete as they had believed, nor was their manipulation of extremist groups across the galaxy under the guise of the First Order. To give the Sloan Veer's plan the greatest chance of success, First Order-aligned government officials, corporate entities, political parties, and paramilitary groups were instructed to seize key infrastructure across the galaxy. On the eve of the operation, apparently suspecting the impending action, a great many of these Sith-aligned parties had been stormed and arrested by authorities acting under the direction of New Republic intelligence. More alarming still, the Republic fleet had moved to a heightened state of readiness, while several military districts had been mobilized. According to First Order agents, the New Republic general staff seemed poised to declare a period preparatory to war. Unaware of the extent to which their campaign had been anticipated by the New Republic, when the Sloan Veer's plan commenced, it was not free from the fears that it might collapse under its own immense weight in the face of enemy fleets and armies well prepared for it. These fears were realized when the first New Republic volunteer group, better known as the Resistance, launched a preemptive strike on Starkiller Base, aiming to destroy the weapon before it could be fired. The intervention, however, came too late. The Horsnian system was destroyed, and the Resistance was forced to withdraw. The opening hours of the war brought reports of victories so overwhelming that astonished Sith Eternal commanders at first refused to believe them. Only after the reports were checked again and again and finally verified did the full extent of the unfolding situation become clear. At the urging of the Resistance, the New Republic armed forces had come to expect some kind of military operation by Imperial remnants, but until the final moments remained largely ignorant of the full force set against them. The loss of their command and control networks over Horsnian Prime paralyzed their entire military apparatus and made any coordinated defense impossible. Worlds that had been contested for years during the Clone Wars and become symbols of hope during the Rebellion were lost in a matter of days. Entire sectors were occupied in just weeks. Coruscant, the center point of the Sloan Veer's plan, was among them. Taken just 100 hours into the campaign, mainly due to the efforts of pro-First Order paramilitary groups on the planet. The only meaningful Republic counterattack occurred 19 days after the destruction of Hosnian Prime. The New Republic Third Sector Fleet, which had only narrowly escaped destruction over Coruscant just weeks earlier, was hastily regrouped and sent to intercept a Sith fleet before it could reach the Sarapin system. But the counterattack by itself had little chance of success, and was seen more as a move to restore a bit of honor to the New Republic Navy before its inevitable capitulation. Still reeling from the heavy impact on New Republic command and control, the Third Fleet entered Sarapin, entirely unaware the enemy elements were already present, not only in the system, but in neighboring star systems to the Third Fleet's rear and flanks. Despite a ferocious opening attack, Sith reinforcements were able to reinforce the system undetected and cross the T of the Republic battle line. The Third Sector Fleet, the pride of the Corps, escaped with only three capital ships and a handful of escorts, less than 10% of its pre-war strength. Setbacks to the Sith Eternal in the first month of the conflict were mostly psychological rather than military in nature, but two in particular would expose the weaknesses inherent to the regime. The first had occurred nearly before the conflict had even started. Supreme Leader Snoke, wary of the reports of a New Republic mobilization, had begun demanding last-minute adjustments to the Sloan Veer's plan. Ironically, it was Grand Marshal Conrad Veer's, son of the late General, who was left to dissuade Snoke from these changes, exclaiming in a heated exchange that one does not improvise the deployment of millions. Snoke's bitter response, your father would have given me a different answer, and Veer's icy reply that Palpatine would have known better than to ask nearly ended in the death of the Grand Marshal. The rift formed between Supreme Leader Snoke and the Sith Eternal High Command would never heal. The second impediment suffered by the Sith occurred on Crate, a backwater world of little importance to the galaxy 
other than its brief use by the Rebellion during the Galactic Civil War. In what should have been an easy victory, Kylo Ren, acolyte to Snoke himself, was poised to destroy the remnants of the New Republic First Volunteer Group, only to be humiliated in a duel against Jedi Master Luke Skywalker. Footage of the Battle of Krait, in which this almost mythic showdown was plainly visible, spread like wildfire across the galaxy, despite attempts by the Sith Eternal to destroy every datapad that contained it. That Skywalker was not merely a mythological figure, as much of the galaxy had come to believe, was nothing less than the thunderbolt that served to revitalize the entire Republic's defense effort. Though the Sith advance continued, its losses escalated as the price of every parsec, every meter of ground, grew ever steeper. The tenacity that Skywalker had spread throughout the galaxy was perhaps best exemplified in the extraordinary efforts of the Lothal, one of the few surviving Endor-class Star Defenders. Cut off behind the ever more distant front lines and pursued relentlessly by Sith battle groups, the Lothal successfully reintegrated dozens of similarly isolated New Republic warships into a makeshift armada. Six times the warship was declared destroyed by the Sith Eternal, until Lady Lothal, as it had become known to its crew and its escorts, escaped into New Republic space, destroying a Sith battle group in the process. As the most capable and experienced ship in opposing the Sith, it would be instrumental in the battle that would bring the war to a new stage. In its first determined move since the start of the invasion, General Leia Organa, the legendary figure of the Galactic Civil War, was elected the head of an emergency New Republic government. Her appointment merely formalized an arrangement that had come into being within days of the initial attacks. Leia achieved a crucial victory that same day, securing the assistance of the Galactic Alliance, a supranational entity that had so far wavered on its commitment to assist the New Republic in the event of war. With a stable, albeit provisional authority in control, the nature of the Republic retreat began to change. Admiral Gael Akbar, appointed by Chancellor Leia as Supreme Commander of the New Republic Navy, worked tirelessly to reform his battered fleets and flotillas. Though he willfully surrendered vast swaths of New Republic territory, entire worlds and star systems, he was also accomplishing important things. He made it impossible for the Sith fleet to close the gap and force the Republic into a naval engagement it had little chance of winning. And he was maintaining good order, his fleets remained fully under control in conditions that might have scattered them across half the galaxy. They increasingly remained in formation, following routes and timetables worked out by Akbar and his headquarters, their every move, planned, coordinated, and carefully directed. Such a retreat could not continue indefinitely, however, unless the New Republic intended to retreat from the entirety of the Corellian run and surrender it to the Sith Eternal. Their fleets would need to stop and make a stand. The Sith Eternal High Command had anticipated the last decisive battle, roughly 70 days from the start of the campaign. As the 50th day arrived, and then the 60th, mounting tensions on both sides made it seem that some kind of climax had to be imminent. Admiral Akbar agreed, and had chosen the site of his great stand, Mongaza. The Battle of Mongaza, known to history as the Miracle at Mongaza, firmly ended the hopes of Supreme Leader Snoke for a swift victory. Caught in the haze of the system's prominent gas clouds, the Sith Eternal's fleet was ambushed by New Republic forces, which scored staggering hits on its warships. The late arrival of several hundred civilian craft, mercenaries, smugglers, and pirates who had become indebted to the Republic's cause was widely considered the turning point of the battle. The victory on the planet itself, meanwhile, was largely attributed to the 34th Droid Legion, a New Republic volunteer group that had swelled in size with the support of the new Separatist Union. But the battle also made famous the names of New Republic officers and soldiers. First among them was Poe Dameron, whose daring interception of Sith bombers was credited with saving the Endor, flagship of the New Republic fleet. But the final victory, in the end, had been the work of the entire New Republic which had come together at the most critical moment and delivered to the Sith Eternal its first defeat. 79 days after it began, the Sith Eternal's offensive along the Corellian Run came to an end. The Sloan Veers plan had failed, and Conrad Veers, 
who had privately admitted to his few friends that he never considered himself the equal of his father, suffered a nervous breakdown upon hearing news of the defeat. Everywhere across the galaxy, the New Republic and Sith Eternal raced to reinforce the lesser task forces and fleets that had been fighting along the other, secondary hyperspace routes. It was a last-ditch, desperate attempt. If a breakthrough along any one of them was achieved and suitably reinforced, then a quick end to the war might have been possible. But wherever the Sith fleets were able to advance, the New Republic forced their retreat someplace else. Eventually, a state of equilibrium was achieved, and the battle lines grew static. Each side was now faced with a battle of attrition, for which neither had prepared. By the end of the first year, the situation had barely changed, with just a few scattered systems exchanging hands since the Battle of Mongaza. This was hardly due to a lack of willpower on either side, but rather the incredible pressure placed on maintaining the supply chains and logistical services on such a wide front. Admirals and generals frequently became distraught upon advancing into lightly defended star systems, only to be unable to conduct any sustained campaign with the supplies they had readily available. In the time it took for them to be properly equipped, the hole in the line was invariably closed. For the New Republic, the daunting challenge was in producing supplies and munitions for a dizzying array of different ships and vehicles, lacking any semblance of standardization. The disparate volunteer groups, which now formed the basis of the growing Republic Army and Navy, so critical in the early months, were now a tremendous burden in a general war of attrition. The Sith Eternal, meanwhile, whose production base was comparatively small, worked feverishly to exploit the resources and industry of its newly conquered territories. Its navy, which had prided itself on stockpiling 1,000 thoralite shock absorbers for each of its heavy turbo lasers, enough, it was thought, for six months of sustained use, was now faced with naval engagements in which 1,000 might be worn out in just a few weeks. Attrition warfare was likewise hated by both sides for its lack of decisive results and the extreme loss of life and equipment such battles produced. The New Republic, however, was much better suited to eventually triumph in such a war. The Horsnian cataclysm that had started the war and the unprovoked nature of the attack had shocked the wider galaxy, while the open adherence to the ancient ideals of the Sith alienated even ardent supporters of the First Order. The New Republic, meanwhile, was flooded with volunteers and even new members as many worlds in the Galactic Alliance pursued full membership. Chief among these were the Mon Calamari, whose initial refusal to join the Republic had been one of the greatest shocks of the post-Imperial era. By the midpoint of the second year of the war, the First Order was now in the astonishing position of having taken great swaths of territory, but still facing a new Republic that had actually grown in size. But with neither side yet capable of achieving a breakthrough in any of the now heavily fortified choke point systems, each began looking for other opportunities to achieve victory. The greatest potential for such a victory, it was determined, was in courting any of the as of yet unaligned powers of the galaxy. Even a state with meager military forces might prove invaluable if they controlled access to certain hyperspace routes. Post-Imperial rump states and other neutral nations were suddenly given lavish promises as to what they might be offered if they would only enter the war on one side or the other. But among the greatest prizes to be won were the Hutt cartels. The Hutts themselves were well aware of this and cynically regarded the neutrality of their space as not a precious state of affairs to be preserved, but a commodity to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. This, in the end, was the New Republic, who announced a substantial loan to the Huts, clearly the prelude to a formal alliance. But the Sith Eternal, rebuffed by the Huts, had clandestinely bought the loyalty of many of the Huts' own mercenaries and private military corporations. When New Republic fleets eventually entered Hut space, it was already in the midst of a civil war, with even Nalhutta and Nar Shaddaa the site of fierce battles between forces aligned to the Sith Eternal and the Hut loyalists. Instead of a new ally that might have shifted the balance, the entry of the Huts only added a new theater to the war, as indecisive as any other. As the war entered its third year, the balance of power began to shift. The New Republic, strengthened by seemingly endless reinforcements from its new members, launched its first offensive campaign since the beginning of the war. 
The losses were exceptional on both sides, but when the first breakthrough was achieved, it provided the conditions for others. Eventually, the successes multiplied until the Sith Eternal was retreating on almost every front. The advance could not be sustained indefinitely, though when the line stabilized once more, hundreds of star systems had been liberated and the war had seemingly entered a new stage. To the Sith Eternal, the future progress of the war seemed obvious. Unless a radically different strategy was devised, the New Republic would continue to deliver such sledgehammer blows in quicker and quicker succession. But Snoke was reluctant to adopt any change in strategy. The Supreme Leader had in fact been increasingly erratic, both in his behavior and appearance. He was more and more combative with the meritocratic Sith Council that he himself had created, insisting on nonsensical plans and hopeless strategies. How Kylo Ren came to assume Snoke's place as the Supreme Leader of the Sith Eternal has remained obscured by propaganda and legend. Yet Snoke's sudden removal and suspected execution by his acolyte was a shock to both sides. He was immediately disliked by his own military commanders, who attempted to isolate Kylo from major decisions concerning strategy and foreign policy. Yet, as the Supreme Leader, Kylo still exerted ultimate authority, and he began dismantling the careful meritocracy upon which the Sith Eternal's military was based. In its place, he assumed greater and greater control over the operations of the state. Under the guise of a possible armistice, the Sith Eternal began peace talks with the New Republic, talks which Kylo Ren had no intention of seeing through to any positive conclusion. Rather, these were screening actions meant to distract the New Republic as the Sith Eternal began a massive reorganization of its front lines. Rather than attempting to hold every system it possessed, as had been done under Snoke, Kylo had masterminded a new line of defense, one that utilized natural hyperspace lanes to create killing fields. No longer would a breakthrough be the primary objective. Instead, the Sith would create meat grinders, carefully selected points that even when they were heavily outnumbered, could inflict murderous casualties on the New Republic. First Order aligned volunteers and sympathizers, the fifth column within the Republic that had played such an important role in the first few months of the war, were now discarded as cannon fodder. Their units were left to garrison planets outside the new perimeter, places where they would be unable to accomplish anything except to feed more bodies into the New Republic's guns. When the peace talks broke down, as the Sith Eternal always intended they would, the fighting intensified across the galaxy. Largely unaware that the Sith had fundamentally altered their deployments, the New Republic was pleasantly surprised when their next offensive action succeeded in taking back scores of contested worlds. But when their forces entered into those systems carefully prepared by the Sith, New Republic losses were extraordinary. Despite overwhelming efforts, the attackers achieved no breakthrough anywhere, just an impressive yet temporary bending of the Sith line. But damage to New Republic fleets was so severe it would have ultimately been better if they had been checked at the beginning. As had happened so many times before, however, the fighting went on long after any chance of success had evaporated. Now in its fourth year of fighting, the New Republic's willingness to sacrifice at even a chance of success was no longer driven by the temptation of a decisive battle, but by the rumors of the atrocities occurring within the Sith Eternal. Everywhere in which the Sith now reigned, the worst aspects of the Galactic Empire repeated themselves. Forced labor and outright slavery sustained Sith industry, while the remainder of the occupied populations suffered other rampant abuses. Much, though not all of these acts, were conducted by the Asha Karat, Sith cultists who had become an elite branch of their armed forces. At the start of the war, they had answered only to Snoke, but now were rumored to be beyond the control of even Kylo Ren. They pillaged the occupied territories of the galaxy, seeking out ancient Jedi and Sith artifacts, while abducting any Force-sensitive individuals they found. So extreme were their methods that they even began to alienate members of the other branches in the Sith Eternal's military, especially those who had truly believed in the righteousness of the invasion and were now shocked by its results. A trickle of defectors began to arrive within the New Republic, and each claimed that the work of the Asha Karat was not random or incidental, but intended to achieve something of critical importance. 
When reports reached New Republic intelligence that the Asha Karat had made an astonishing discovery within the old Jedi Temple on Coruscant, it was decided to launch a new offensive action, the greatest of the war. Whatever the Asha Karat had found, it had seemingly caused Kylo Ren to retreat from his role in leading the war efforts. According to new reports, he had left those duties to his commanders and had withdrawn to the unknown regions. While a sense of foreboding prevailed across the strange intelligence coming out of the Sith Eternal, it was believed there would never be a better chance to strike. Pivotal to the New Republic offensive would be a growing core of conspirators within the Sith army. Increasingly uncomfortable with the actions of the Asha Karat and the disappearance of Kylo Ren, it had found a leader in Finn, a stormtrooper who had defected to the New Republic just prior to the outbreak of the war and was now an agent of New Republic intelligence. Finn, through his resolve, organizational abilities, and radical approaches, had put an end to the inactivity and doubts within the conspirators and united them against Kylo Ren. Their greatest asset was Armitage Hux, a Sith loyalist, who nevertheless had come to despise the Supreme Leader. Operation Urso, the New Republic's great offensive, would occur simultaneously with a coup attempt in the Sith Eternal. Though Hux, Finn, and the other conspirators had every hope of success, even the confusion caused by its failure would hopefully be enough to enable the offensive to succeed. Thousands of starships, millions of troops were mobilized along the lines. The growing New Republic army, its allies in the Galactic Alliance, and hundreds of volunteer groups. They were joined by pre-positioned elements of the New Republic Rangers that had infiltrated behind the lines. After four years of little progress, everything seemed to be in place for a victory that would finally end the war. The first indication that something had gone wrong came from the Sith conspirators. Instead of the simple codes used to signify whether the coup had succeeded, their transmissions were garbled and confused. New Republic intelligence assets all across the occupied territories began broadcasting warning signals before one by one, they went completely silent. Chancellor Leia Organa alone seemed to have understood what was taking place and against the advice of every commander, called off the offensive and ordered the forces involved to instead scatter to their respective withdrawal points. Since the failure of the Sloan Veer's plan, engineers and scientists within the Sith Eternal had searched for a way to reactivate Starkiller Base, left without a power source since it first fired. A crude replication of the Death Star, the base had been designed to only fire once, but as the war entered its long period of stagnation, the Sith Eternal became desperate for any weapon that might tip the balance. And while the complete reactivation of the base was impossible, an even greater breakthrough had been made. A weapon able to nearly replicate the destructive power of Starkiller Base, but small enough to be mounted on a Star Destroyer. The first salvo of the Zeistan class was fired as the New Republic was in the middle of withdrawing its forces from Operation Urso. It struck nine planets across the line, precisely the points at which the New Republic had been concentrating its forces. The losses were cataclysmic. The Zeistan class lacked the raw power of the Death Star or Starkiller base, but was more than enough to decimate a planet and the fleets around it. The greatest shock to the New Republic, however, was in the demand for surrender that followed, broadcast not by Kylo Ren, but Emperor Palpatine. That the Emperor had somehow returned was as terrible a blow as the Zeistan strike itself. Defeatism began to creep across the New Republic and the Galactic Alliance. Generals and admirals began to speak of a negotiated peace. Chancellor Leia was adamantly opposed, but when another nine worlds were destroyed just two weeks later, any sort of peace, even one dictated by the reborn Emperor, seemed preferable. The New Republic had been given its timetable, the destruction of nine worlds every two weeks until one way or another, the war came to an end. With the location of the Sith Eternal in the unknown regions still entirely unknown, even if the remainder of the galaxy were liberated, there seemed to be no chance of confronting Palpatine, let alone victory. Only some outside element had the potential to change the course of the war, but as it entered its fifth year, that element revealed itself to the weary Republic. When the war had first started, 
Nearly every Imperial successor state had aligned itself to the First Order, and then the Sith Eternal. Yet, the largest of these states had remained conspicuously indifferent. During the stalemate, both sides had attempted to align this potentially powerful ally to their interests, but in every case had been rebuffed. It had instead waited patiently on the sidelines, standing by for the moment in which its intervention could make the greatest possible impact and impose the greatest possible price. Since the signing of the Galactic Concordance, this state had proclaimed itself to be nothing less than the Galactic Empire, its true successor. But the galaxy knew it by a different name. They called it the Empire of the Hand. The operation proposed by Grand Admiral Mithro Naruado, or simply Thrawn, was every bit as audacious as the Sloan Veer's plan. Though the New Republic leadership was appalled by the thought of working with one of the greatest supporters of the old Imperial regime, they could not deny its chance of success. It had been Thrawn who had led the first explorers from the Republic and later Empire into the unknown regions, and none equaled his understanding of its labyrinthine roots. Armed with his knowledge, a fleet of ships could be sent almost directly to Exegol, and if successful, end the war in a single stroke. With the impending destruction of another nine worlds just days away, with little time to prepare, the New Republic initiated the final campaign of the war. All along the line, its forces advanced, striking with a persistence that stunned the Sith defenders. Yet these efforts were merely a diversionary tactic, meant to give the fleet en route to Exegol every hope of success. It was a bewildering assortment of forces, elements of the New Republic military, Thrawn's Imperial-era armada, Finn's defectors, and other volunteer groups, many of which used equipment dating back to the Clone Wars. They were joined by every other ship fit to fly that the galaxy could muster. Yet, when the moment finally arrived, and the battle was joined over Exegol, the outcome of the war came to depend on one soul alone. A scavenger named Rey, the last of the Jedi, and the first of the Skywalkers. Thanks for watching the Templin Institute's vision of what the First Order New Republic War might have been. We tried our best to create a memorable and interesting variation of a galactic conflict, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Which version of the war do you prefer? Is there an area where you think we particularly succeeded or failed? Is this a dangerous slide into the world of fan fiction? Let us know in the comments below. And if you'd like to get your hands on the artwork we commissioned for this episode, it is available on our website in HD resolution with a 4K variant exclusively on our Patreon for every $2 pledge and above. Thanks for your support.